innovation, disruption, and big issues. This is Business Game Changers with Sarah Westall. Westall. Welcome to Business Game Changers. I'm Sarah Westall. Today we're going to talk about the Civil War, and I have guest Roberta Grimes here today, and she believes, along with her co-author, Kelly Glover, that the United States completely messed up the emancipation for slavery, and that that is what's going on today with the black people in this country, that we never sufficiently ended slavery. And there's three waves of slavery when they were actually in bondage. And then after, when we had the Jim Crow laws up through the mid-1960s, and then our modern day. Everybody would agree that in the up through the 1960s, there was extreme discrimination. But at that time, black families were a tight unit. In fact, there is more married and family units amongst black people than white people. But the war on poverty, surprise, our federal government came in and completely messed that up. And it ultimately ended up breaking down the family units in the black community. And that's what we have going on today. So we're going to talk about that with Roberta. And I don't want to waste much more time because this is a good interview is going to take up the full hour. So let's get right into that interview with Roberta Grimes. Hi, Roberta. Welcome to the program. How are you? It's so good to see you. I'm doing great. I am so glad you're back. And we are going to talk about your new book, which is fantastic. And you're covering a really important issue. And I want to hear your take on all these different questions I have. Some of them are going to be uh, the, the counter question to what your perspective was on the book. But I got to ask it because a lot of people are going to be thinking different things. And so I need to pry into your brain and figure out why you put what you did there down. So when people have the same questions I'm going to be asking you, which is the opposite of what maybe you said, you can explain yourself more and maybe get through to more people. And that's what we're trying to do, right? Okay. So you wrote the book, Fun Living Together. First of all, why did you write the book and why did you invite Kelly Glover to write it with you? Well, Kelly and I have been friends for a decade she we we would just go out to lunch every once in a while we met through a church and we just sort of had the same perspective on things we were both working on you know serious careers and so we gave we were sort of each other's resource for talking about some of our issues and sharing you know suggestions and we never talked about race it never came up it was like not important to what we were doing but one day I had a question I think it was late last summer and I asked her uh, the question didn't think it was significant, but I got her talking. And when I got her talking, it opened so many amazing, appalling topics in my mind that I had never thought about. I mean, I've lived a completely white bread life. I it never, I never thought of her as black until I started asking her these questions. And then she made me see me see her as black, and she made me see what it was like to be black. And she's upper middle class. Her parents were much more successful than my parents. And still, she's got to deal with issues. So the more I thought about it, the more I thought, this is a book. And she helped me with it. As uh, She wrote one of the introductions. She wrote her own chapter. And she critiqued the rest of it. Uh, the whole book is really our joint effort, although we wrote it mostly in my voice. But I didn't even think about it. A year ago, I wasn't thinking about this topic. That's how much it ambushed me. Well, it's interesting when you have uh, friends who are – black and have to experience it. And then you get a chance to understand it more from their perspective. You state that slavery still exists as America's core problem. Why are you saying that? Because obviously we don't have slavery in the sense that we understand it. So help us understand what you mean by this. Well, you have to understand that slavery is probably the oldest human institution. It has always existed. This principle that some people are more important and better than other people, there are inferiors who are less, and the more important people can make the less important people, you know, be submissive to them and do things for them or whatever. It's existed in all kinds of forms everywhere on earth. Every person watching us is descended from slaves, every one of us. Every the, race, right? I mean, every race. Every race. But yeah. see, here's the, here's the distinction. In nearly all cases, the, the masters and the slaves look pretty much alike. So slavery came and went in societies. When people were freed, they could just join the society because they looked like the society. What was introduced to the United States, what became the United States, was an aberrant kind of slavery in which everyone who was a slave was imported from a place where, where there was dark skin 
And everyone, nearly everybody who came here as an immigrant had white skin. So from way before our nation's founding, we had this submissive, demeaned group of people, most of whom were slaves, not all of them. Some of them had, were freed, but they still lived as an underclass. That was the first stage of American slavery. It ended with a civil war. And I think we have to understand that the worst possible way we have now proven the worst possible way to end something like slavery is with a civil war because we made it impossible to complete emancipation. Emancipation is really a multi-step process. One step is legal emancipation. Nobody can tell you what to do anymore. But the more important part is empowerment so that people know how to be part of a society. They're accepted into it officially. They're, they're, everyone you know, has to accept them as equal and so on. The empowerment part was not done. When, during, in, 1960, in 1865 or in the century after, the empowerment part was not done. And in fact, right after the Civil War, almost immediately, the conquerors went home. They did nothing to help the black people at all that had just been freed. They didn't educate them. They didn't give them, tell them what their rights were and how to get those rights. They didn't insist that the white society accept them. They did nothing for them, nothing. As a result, they were immediately re-enslaved. And that happened around, 19, around 1870. And how were they re-enslaved? Because they mentally couldn't, they didn't know how to be free. The people around them didn't see them as free individuals. And how were they immediately enslaved? By law segregation, the fact that they couldn't do so many things they might have wanted to do, they couldn't, you know, have certain, nearly all uh, occupations were closed to them in the South. See, we had a lighter version of it in the North, but it existed in the North too. Segregation existed, um, you know, separate everything. Most people really couldn't get anywhere in terms of a career. They were not accepted anywhere in white society. It was more complete in the South, but it was certainly existed in the North. And they, if they attempted to join white society, they were brutalized. It was a time of the only thing that they didn't have anymore was an individual white owner. Because that, I, I guess because the people in the South knew they couldn't do that after the 13th and 14th Amendments. But every, in every other way, they were enslaved. If people find that hard to believe, I urge them to read Letter, Letter from Birmingham Jail. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. wrote that at the age of 34. He had a PhD. He was, if his skin had been the color of yours and mine, he could have done anything with his life. But you can, when you read that letter and understand that it was written a hundred years, almost to the day after the Emancipation Proclamation was signed, you realize slavery still existed a hundred years later. Can you give us an example of what some of the laws were that caused them to be enslaved? So that it's not of, just a, you know, so it's not just a statement. It's somebody can go, oh, yeah, that really would cause that. It wasn't just the laws. I mean, these people lived under a federal, you know, the, the, the federal, the 13th Amendment. Could, they couldn't do what they were doing. The 14th Amendment, they certainly couldn't do what they were doing. But nobody on the federal level enforced it against the states. So the states and the municipalities had all kinds of laws ranging from, segregation, strict segregation everywhere, um, you know, including on public transit. Um, there were things like hotels and motels were white only. All bathrooms were white only. Um, churches were, were white only or, or black only. Strictly separated in, a, in the, in the, the uh, movie theaters, the black people had to sit in the balcony. This was just the way they lived. They lived segregated lives entirely. In some cases, there was there were you literally had to be white in order to be in certain occupations, and that was by ordinance. But wasn't there um, certain things that they did which caused them to go to jail pretty easily? Like they'd set them up, and then they'd end up having to go to prison, and then All and the yeah, and so a lot the yeah, they were set up, and then they're in prison, and then when they're in prison, they were working working for the government or working for the state or working for some corporation the only jobs they could get the most common occupation during those hundred years for black people in the south was sharecropper a sharecropper is a slave who can always walk off the job that's all a sharecropper is they 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 basically reinstituted all the trappings of slavery including the brutality um black people were routinely whipped they were hung from trees they were beaten up and brutalized if they even looked a little funny at a white person. If they got anywhere near a white woman, 
they could be murdered. I mean, Emmett Till is a famous example. A 14-year-old kid was apparently, you know, looked at a, at, a, at a white woman the wrong way, and he ended up destroyed. So it's, it was terrible. And as a sharecropper, they got paid so little they could barely just feed themselves and house themselves, right? Which is what they had before. The heroes of the of the, the Jim Crow period, what I call slavery without papers period, were the men. Because under impossible conditions, they established healthy communities, segregated, yes, very poor, yes. But they, they defended them often with their lives. And they reared their children to be good, solid American citizens who were reared good children in their turn. In, in their communities, believe it or not, the, the, the African-Americans under the worst of Jim Crow lived very healthy lives. They just lived under the boot of the white community. So your book suggests that the Civil War was a result of unwise, unwise action by the federal government. And they could have done it differently. What could they have done differently to keep this from being essentially slavery again? Most Southern whites did not own slaves or know someone who owned slaves. Slaveholders and people who had a stake in slavery were a, a very much a minority in the United States um, from its founding. And so they could very easily have allowed a process to go forward uh, where we were educating people about the evils of slavery. And we um, got to the point where we, the federal government was full enough. You know, we had enough people in Congress. How do you change anything? You change it by law. So that we had enough people by the early 1800s who wanted to get rid of this. We set up a process. I'll tell you who had a great process and never got to put it into place was Thomas Jefferson. You never saw anybody so angry as he was about slavery and so determined to end it. And um, unfortunately, after his wife died, he kind of fell apart. But it, he was he would have ended it. But what his plan was first, we educate a generation of children. We, we empower them. We make, we make them grow up thinking of themselves as free. We, he was going to import Germans because they had, didn't have slaves at that time for, in Germany. And he came to like the Hessians during the Revolutionary War. Import them to live with his own, next to his own families on his, his land and sort of get – that was how he was going to mix the races to start. And then he was going to expand it all over the country. If, if, if his wife would have lived, he would not have – he would have quit everything uh, at the end of the Revolutionary War and done that with the rest of his life. But what he proposed could have, could have been done in the early 1800s. And it was enough – of a, of, a, of a powder keg, enough of a problem that people knew it was going to explode. They just, it was never number one on anybody's list. It was number seven or number 10. Got to get to that. Got to get to that. And they kept putting off doing something about slavery until the South started to secede because they, you know, we don't want you to have slaves, you know, do something where we're, we're progressing toward ending it. And the question of whether a state could secede had never been settled. So when South Carolina and then Virginia and others started to secede, they thought they had the right. We'll just do a new country here. We'll have slavery. You don't have to. It's fine. Then there might have been a way that negotiation could have happened. And we could have uh, uh, the Civil War was an unmitigated disaster. It didn't really even help the black people in this country. It was a disaster. And the, it was remnants of the Civil War that made it much worse for black people under Jim Crow because they couldn't pick out the white people who had caused this problem, but they knew the problem was about freeing the black people. And I think that the Jim Crow period was much worse for black people because of the civil war. And we did nothing about it. We as a nation did nothing about it for a hundred years. And only the, only when Dr. King and his, his followers said, Hey, you got to fix this. Only then did we start to fix it hundred years. Well, and it made it worse. Why? Because the South, the white Southerners were angry, right? with the civil war and everything that they lost. I mean, they lost everything and they projected their anger towards the blacks. Is that accurate? I think, yes. I mean, you did need to do a study to determine how much of what was done to them was that, but it was too, there was too much personal hatred involved in what the white people in the South did. I mean, it takes energy. It takes a rage and the black people have really done nothing to them. But they were taking out their rage on, on these people who were innocent, who were, you know, they tied, in fact, to the Civil War, not unreasonably. Okay, so many scholars believe that the Civil War was not about slavery, right? But when you look back on history and everybody talks it's about slavery, but a lot of them say that it's about taxation and states' rights, okay? It was about states' rights. It was about whether 
states had a right to secede fundamentally because what what made it what touched it off was when the states actually started to secede you know if you're in you should be able to be, you know, to leave and and that was and it was nothing. about taxation as well now do you think that the civil war would have happened anyways even if they would have done a um propaganda campaign if you will to try to you know get people to think that slavery was not a good thing or it was slavery the catalyst for the state's rights abraham lincoln said if he could have found a way to um end the civil war without freeing the southern slaves he would have done it i mean it was slavery was not the top of anyone's list i think that uh yeah, I mean, that's a question I've never thought about. I think the Civil War could have been avoided much more easily uh, if we had come up with a way to make the southern states, if we could have solved slavery separately, because that was a black and white switch issue. You know, taxation is how much, how little. I mean, that's a negotiable issue. You can't negotiate slave or free. So we had to get slavery out of the way or the Civil War would have happened inevitably anyway. But if they had uh, had done that peacefully, but it it wasn't only because we might have awarded the Civil War. It was because we could have, from the time of emancipation, had actually free people. We, to this day, do not have free people. Fl slavery in the United States has existed in three stages. The first was chattel slavery that ended in 1865. The second was what I call uh, slavery without papers, and that's the Jim Crow period that ended in 1964. The third was economic slavery, and that started in 1965. There's never been a moment when the black community has been free and equal or thought to be such. We're so welcome. We, we're going to talk about the third stage pretty soon, but can you explain, they call it the Jim Crow era. What is the Jim Crow era? That, the Jim Crow era was a, a period, and it was called Jim Crow after some character in some book, some you know, very uh, negative book about black people, some guy named Jim Crow. I, it's The Jim Crow period was a period of complete debasement of black people who are technically free, but were not allowed to have um, American citizenship, citizenship rights at all. They couldn't vote. They couldn't. There was not the only difference between that and slavery was they didn't have individual owners so they could leave. And that's when we had the Great Migration. It took a few generations. We had a Great Migration out of the South. But in the South, they had to live as second-class citizens. We had a two-class society in which one class was very much below the, the other and considered to be inferior and basically despised. That's what, the, that's what the Jim Crow period was. And they were treated poorly on a regular basis on the streets, on yeah. buses, everywhere. Yes. And that's what people don't realize, right? They didn't, the white people didn't want to be by them. Um, you did a little story in your book of, of a little girl that, that, where another little girl was yelled at by their parent because they didn't want them to play with her because she had darker skin. Oh, boy. That's my oh, little father. boy, whatever. <laughs> little girl, kid. Her father's a PhD. She's still growing up in a segregated community um, in, near Detroit. And the, the, this is another thing I didn't understand. There's there's extreme um, colorism within the black community. And most of the, the black people doing better back then had very light skin. And they were living in one of these communities. But she has quite dark skin, as you can see from the picture on the back of our book. And she would, she would play outside. Her little neighbor, little boy next door would come and play with her. And then she would go in to get something and immediately he'd be gone. And she asked her mother, why does he always go, go in when I come in the house? So his mother watched and saw that as soon as, as my friend Kelly was, came in the house to get whatever she was going to get, the mother of the other came out. And she was apparently very light. She had red hair and everything. And she would lecture her son again, I don't want you playing with that little dark girl. Mm -hmm. And pull, her, pull him into the house. I had no idea this was going on. But it goes on today. We have infected these people with our own stupidity. I mean, it goes on today. Well, that stupidity of lighter skin is happening everywhere. That's why the bleach agents are so popular, like in the Asian communities and, and not just our country, but other countries where the lighter skin are treated better. It's absolutely absurd. <laughs> it's ridiculous. She says, and I think it's right, that it stems from the colonial period when People with light skin were conquering the world, and therefore you wanted to be with the conquerors, not with the conquered. But 
my, my whole focus and her whole focus in this book is on America, because when we fix the problem here, we will go a long way toward fixing it all over the world. We are the leaders in this. And the fact that we have not fixed our own problem means we have a no authority um, to fix the, the rest of the world. But also, um, we, we if we can't do it, why? Nobody can do it. I mean, I, I guess it's that simple. We're proving every day that this is an insoluble problem, that the, the, the difference of races and, the, and, and racial separation, and it's an easily solved problem. 30 years from now, it will not exist. Well, you say that up through the 1950s, the black neighborhoods had family units that were healthy. They might have been poor, but they were healthy. Father, Amazing. mother, children, whatever. But the war on poverty, and I want you to talk about this, is the third stage of that you that you bring about. Economic slavery. Yeah, it destroyed their families in a period of two decades, and it turned into barbarism on the street. That's your quote. What do you mean by that? I got a newspaper. <laughs> the, if, Not if just look, the barbarism. Yeah, we can talk about what that barbarism is. But look, what do you I, mean by – I want you to talk about that whole concept, third wave of slavery. One of the things many people believe is that, well, under slavery, they didn't have families. So, of course, they don't have them now. That is absolute nonsense. The Civil War ended in 1865. There was a census done in 1870, five years later. And in it, there were actually, I'm told, I haven't checked personally, but I'm told that there were actually more married African-Americans adults than there were married Caucasian adults. And believe it or not. So somehow in that five year period, they all got married. So they had been we know they paired up during slavery, although sometimes, of course, the families would be separated. But they made families under slavery and they immediately the one freedom they had was they could go and get married. And they did in huge numbers and all during the Jim Crow period, all during this worst of all possible times for any free American because they weren't free at all. Well, during that time, their families were tight. The 1960 census, again, shows about the same percentage of intact black families as intact white families. And we know that there was no pathology in their community. All of the, the crimes that they committed were white people saying they committed a crime. But they, they were fundamentally healthy societies, you know, young men growing up to be good, solid citizens. Then what happened was, in, uh, I consider 1964, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, to be the end of the second period of American slavery. 1965, the federal government did the stupidest thing it has ever done, and we know there are a lot of contenders for that title. But this is <laughs> I was going to say, there are some good contenders up there. What, what they did was to begin to pay poor women if they would evict the fathers from their children's lives. Well, why? And, what was the... What was the quote unquote reason for that like they 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 thought that they were going to fix poverty by giving people supplemental income and for some reason it was seemed that it was deemed to be necessary to do that only for single women single mothers you're helping single mothers so let, what but what this did of course these people had never been free to the to to the day in 1965 only the previous year had the civil rights act been passed and Dr. King got it. He would have fixed this. But he was a couple of years away from being assassinated. And before he could get his feet, feet under him to really lead the civil rights movement toward complete emancipation, which is what where he was heading, um, he was killed. But what happened in the, in the black community in the South among people who had never had for a day been free Americans was that the fathers were, then had a lot of trouble supporting their families. Um, the, because the, or, the, the order was being disrupted in the South. There was even more anger against black people because they were getting so uppity. And the, a lot of the black the fathers lost their jobs. So around millions of American kitchen tables, the same conversation was held at some point in the late 60s and in the 70s. I lost my job. I can't get another one. They say I'm too uppity. Whatever the reason was, I can't get a job. I'm going to have to move out. So you can take the government's help and we can feed the children. So was it a backlash against the movement, the uppity claim? And well, they couldn't be uppity during the, uh, the Jim Crow period either. But there was there was a lot more racial tension because bad as Jim Crow was, there was a settled, it was a settled society. Everyone sort of lived in a settled 
they knew their rank. You know, they the black people didn't, they, they, they wanted to live in their own communities at peace. They didn't, few of them, very few of them, until Dr. King came along and said enough, very few of them really challenged the status quo. But when, when it started, when it got to the point where they, there was open fighting between blacks and whites in the South, it became harder for, for fathers to support their families. And the government said, here's an easy way, just move out and we'll take care of the family. There's a great um, clip uh, of Robert Kennedy in the spring that he was assassinated. Um, he's saying, they might have wanted husbands, they might have wanted fathers, and we've given them a check. And that yeah. sums it up pretty well. And that's Robert Kennedy saying it. I think a husband and a father breaking up that family unit is destroying the communities. And we're doing that now with mass incarceration, which I want to get into. And we're doing it in other communities as well, which we're going to touch on a little bit because I want your perspective on it. But this is a big issue. How does lowering expectations on anyone because we've done this across the board to a lot of people. How does lowering expectations on anyone ultimately turn that person into a victim? The very fact that we don't, especially children, I don't know about adults. Adults are kind of, you know, it's baked in the cake at that point. But the, one of the greatest tragedies we face right now is the fact that more than 60 years after Brown versus Board of Education made it illegal to have segregated schools, our schools are more segregated than they've ever been. I just saw um, a report about five Baltimore African-American high schools, five, in which not one child proved to be proficient on standardized testing in either math or English. One child got a three. It's a one through five split scale, and in all those schools, one, one child got a three, most of them got a one, and you had to get a four or a five to be proficient. That's how bad those, high, those schools are. And they're high schools. What seems to be happening, and I haven't studied this as much as I intend to, but what seems to be happening based on anecdotal information and things like that result is that they're, 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 the poor dears, they're assuming the kids can't hack it, and they don't want them to feel bad about themselves, so they're not teaching them. One of the mothers of those children said, this isn't a report card for the kids. This is a report card for the teachers. And she's right. So somebody listening to us is saying, oh, well, they weren't paid. They were spending $16,000 per child on these schools. And that's the fourth highest payment on schools in the country per capita, that particular school district. So there's no excuse for it. The only explanation is we haven't expected the kids to learn. They're not going to learn. Poor children of any color need very good schools in which people challenge them. They say, you're behind the eight ball because you're poor. The only way for you to make it in America is you've got to become great in school. And then they got to, you know, so here's the extra homework. They've got to challenge the kids and they've got to partner with the parents well, and say I, to them, they're I, helping kids by I, doing this. I've done a show on, this, on the school system, which is a great show. I have some of these best shows that don't get many views on YouTube because I put them up right away, but... And so it's not, they're not out in front of people, but the best show on, um, schools in, in America, and th it's a complex problem. There's a lot of politics that are involved. A lot of things go to the administration. The focus on the unions and the, and the administration is out of whack. And, um, there's things that you're talking about, but then the culture and the communities aren't what it needs to be either to support education and to value education. So what do we do? We partner with the parents. The parents want their kids to succeed. And if we say to the parents, look, here's the issue. We've got this issue with the community. We've got this, that we've got this other issue and we've got to give your kids a lot more work and make them try harder. Will you help us? The parents will help. Everyone assumes I'll tell you what, what's really tragic. There are three unspoken assumptions now developing in this country, all of which are wrong. Number one is the assumption that there's a difference between black and white. There is. No more than, there's no difference. No more than there's a difference between blue eyes and brown eyes. That's all it is. It's a trait. Many of the smartest people who ever lived had dark skin. So that's, that's not an issue. The first thing we assume is a difference. The second is we assume maybe they're not quite so smart. Nonsense. Both of them are nonsense. And the third thing we think is, you know, maybe we can't ever solve this because we haven't been able to, right? And look at all that we've done to try to solve it. The reason we haven't been able to solve it is we've been addressing symptoms of the core problem, which is just the basic problem that Jefferson faced and that Dr. King faced. People think there's a difference and there's a, a sort of a separation. We've got to bring people together. But we don't fix it 
by attacking poverty, which was the disastrous war on poverty idea. We don't fix it by attacking segregation because that and that's we know how that didn't go well. We don't fix it by by um, attacking um, you know racism. Racism is a false belief. So how do we cure false beliefs? With with evidence and information. That's all. People are not racist by nature. We're tribalist. I'll tell you one of the ways we fix racism forever. There's a magical time before the age of six when we're in download mode. Literally, they can tell it with the brain waves. We're learning. We're just we're learning what reality is, who we are, where we fit, what who our tribe is, because we're very tribal. Mm-hmm. My children grew up with and their first closest when they were three, four years old, their their closest playmates were the black family that lived next door. And their two first babysitters were the beautiful, you know, daughters of that family. As a result, to this day, my kids are utterly not racist. They don't, I've talked to them as I was working on this book, you know, how do you see the world? They don't even understand the concept of racism, that's, really. That's, that's awesome. Yeah, that's so excellent. Think about that. We inoculate our children against all sorts of obscure diseases they're never going to get. The most important thing we can inoculate an American child of any color against is racism. And the easy way to do it is they all play together when they're three years old. Yeah, get them all um, mixed in when they're little. They're lives long. Yes, that's right. It's that well, easy. Well, your book points to studies that fathers are needed not only for boys, because we know they're needed for boys, mm-hmm. but also really necessary for girls. I mean, I think this is an obvious claim, but what have the studies shown? I haven't examined studies in detail. I've just looked at what, what, because we've been conducting an experiment, a mass experiment in the United States that we had no right to conduct. We have for 50 years been rearing a whole lot of children without fathers in the home. What have we learned from that? We've learned that without a father, girls tend to, to experiment sexually earlier, they tend to be less have less um, confidence about themselves. They they te- they they don't have the respect for themselves and other women that that children do who have a good father. Well, the good Girls- father. I mean, just based on my experience with my husband and my daughter, <laughs> the father tends to be. Now every family is different, and I'm stereotyping here. But with my husband, and I've seen it in others, they tend to be so protective of their daughters. And they're like, no way are you going to be, you know, treated this way. Girls learn to be precious. They learn that they are precious when they have a father who's like your husband. So bless you for giving your daughter that. And they, so that, so they, they take better care of themselves. They respect themselves more because that's what dad taught them when they were tiny. But it's optional-ish for women because their mothers also can do a good job of that if they're sensitive. And I don't mean to say anything against women who are raising a son alone. Bless you. You're doing a very difficult job, and I hope you can do it well. We have proven on a mass scale that if you raise a lot of boys that way, you end up with a disaster. I mean, I can say statistics that will break your heart, and none of these existed before 1965. It took a few years, and then we we descended into chaos. Yeah, tell us the statistics, because boys need dads so much. A third of, of African American men now cycle in and out of prison. Oh, that's terrible. Third. The comparable statistic for white men is 5%. They're 13% of the population, approximately, but African Americans um, are half to more than half each year of the murder victims, and nearly all their killers are black. And if you go into the statistics, they're overwhelmingly very young and overwhelmingly male. African, young African, actually, more to the point, young American boys are murdering other young American boys in the streets of America's cities. And we are somehow not calling that a code red alarm. That isn't a code red alarm right there. Okay, let's let's talk about the at the opposite side of this equation. Somebody that's going to push back and they're going to say, yeah, but we only put the true criminals in prison and they deserve to be there. I want you to answer this. I've done a whole show on this, so I know the answer. They deserve to be there, and the streets are safer as it is. I've heard people say this, and I get I get frustrated. I've done shows on this. I know the answer, but I want to hear it from you. All, all we're doing, our, our prisons are reading grounds for crime. I mean, you, you put someone in there who's done something relatively modest, and there are things that are against the law that people are locked up for that are trivial. Many of the drug crimes are really trivial. 
But you put him in there and he's basically in a school for crime. He goes in when he's young and has probably not much of a sense of a, for being a criminal. And he learns from the experts and he comes out. And if you could lock, here's a theory. If you could lock them up forever, if they ever do the slightest thing wrong, if there were a way to do that, you'd make a much safer street. But what we're doing now is like a, a hotbed of crime in each of these prisons and then we let them out when they're hardened criminals and they do a lot worse stuff well then they're angry because they've been thrown in for something m menial they get treated like crap and then they're out there on the streets angry which i would be i'm a fighter i tend to push back Even and if they're I, not angry they're hopeless when, I, when you look at I'd a young angry. <laughs> if, you go, if you go into a city and you look at a young african-american man especially you're seeing someone who never had a chance in life. He was a failure the day he was born because he would, didn't have a dad. His mom, of course, did her best, but he needed a dad. It's like you make your baking a cake. You need all the ingredients, and that's a key ingredient for making a man. They, they don't he have the a, baking powder or the baking his, soda. His school, it was so bad. That it doesn't rise. Most of the kids drop out. I've forgotten what the statistic is, but the, the dropout rate among African Americans is very high. And I've seen a Pew study done over 50 years on incarceration rates um, for, for men with and without high school diplomas, black and white. And there are, there are two lines which are, you know, sort of low over 50 years, and that's the white lines. Then there's the, the, the African Americans with some high, uh, with, without, uh, with a high school diploma, which is, you know, better. And then there's the African American kids, which is most of them without a, a diploma. As soon as about 19... 68, a few years after the Warren property started, it goes like this, and it stays up there forever. Well, I know, I know what the mass incarceration rate, it happened in the 90s, which was the, you know, the war on crime and things that happened. And they were, they were incarcerating crack cocaine at higher levels than powder cocaine. And I've talked to many doctors that says there's virtually no difference in what they, you know, in the actual results and what, it, it was ridiculous. But they're also, imprisoning people for small petty crimes like you were saying um when bankers and and big prime crimes are getting away with all sorts of things but they would they would have um people like they would have a young 19 year old beginning weed and his younger 15 year old brothers in the car with them never did anything and the 15 year old gets sucked into the problem and they have to go to prison too. Now the other issue is that the public defenders get about seven minutes per person that they defend. The prosecutors are very well funded. The defenders are not. So everybody's playing whether they're guilty or not. And as soon as they get into the system for a couple of years, they're sucked into that, that world of crime. It's terrible. Yeah. I see this as another one of those symptoms. A lot of crime, we're attacking the symptom and not the problem. When we attack the problem, all of these things will go away. There was no um, um, crime, no uh, drug problem during Jim Crow because the fathers would not have allowed it. We caused so many problems for this nation that affect white as well as black people simply by doing the incredibly stupid thing of removing black men from their community. We turned black men with the war on poverty into throwaway people. Well, because they should be fathers. Instead, they're drug dealers and problems or in prison. We threw them away. We didn't want them to advance in white society. You know, they, they couldn't do that. But until 1965, they had a crucial role in the family and in the community. They were the pillars of the family and the community. They were the reason people survived and thrived, even in horrible circumstances. And then we turn them into throwaways. They couldn't have that role either. If you, if you take a man and you tell him he has no role in life that matters, what do we expect we'll get? We get what we have now. Yeah. And we tell it to the boys. The little boys are not stupid. They grow up learning they're not going to have a role in life. Well, what do you think of when the political parties this year, I mean, it was pretty obnoxious, when they use racism as a way to win the election? Oftentimes you see a claim against a Republican saying that they were extremely racist. They were for almost doing nothing. They were calling them racist or they would take words out of context. Like in my <laughs> own state, they did that to one of the state representatives and he was he was being creamed for nothing. They took him totally out of context and tried to make him into this big time racist. Um, what do you think what of that? 
I think it's obscene. Whenever you call someone a racist, you turn that person into a racist. We draw, we are rational people. We draw conclusions based upon evidence. It is rational to assume things in this society that are not true because the evidence is overwhelming. And if you then turn, if you then call that person a racist, you're turning what was just a hypothesis into a fact. All right, I'm racist and I'll never be otherwise. So everybody who uses the term racist is contributing substantially to the problem. We can never say it again. Racism is simply ignorance, lack of information. We have to, so that's the first thing I think. The people who you who throw around that word are basically evil. There is no other way to put it. They're, they're, they're trying to, to profit personally off what is a tragedy in this country that affects all of us. Yeah, I, I couldn't, I did a report on that. It couldn't have made me more angry of when I would see somebody who I thought was innocent towards that and they would call them that just so they could win the election. That made me angry because there are serious issues, but don't do that. There are big issues, but let's attack the issue. Let's not, yeah. there's not a living person. There's not a living person who ever owned a slave or was a slave. And there's not a living person who, who created the disaster for this country that the war on poverty has been. They're all dead. We haven't done it. We're left with to, to fix it up. But anybody who uses the term racist is making it harder. Anybody who tries to divide white from black. Now, I get the anger. Mm -hmm. I get it. I'm angry, too. Just having done this research, I'm angry. But anger doesn't help. No, it doesn't. Dr. I know King, what you're saying. Dr. I King said he would. You never met an angrier man than he was. But he said anger doesn't help. Hatred doesn't help. He said, I've decided to stick with love. Hate is too great a burden to bear. And everything he did was based in love. And he brought down the Jim Crow South using love as his weapon. I got to tell you, anybody who understands the mass incarceration issue or how we're tearing apart families, um, it's hard not to get angry. It's hard not to see these poor people who did nothing wrong be treated oh, so poorly. So I have a hard time not being angry too, but it's important that we keep our wits about us, right? And we, we try to bridge and try to unite. And that's what your message is. My message is Dr. King's message. Dr. King was the greatest American of the 20th century. And the more time that passes, the more the greater he is going to look in the rearview mirror. And I think he's going to be shown to be, have been one of the greatest Americans who ever lived. And I think of him as our modern founding father. He set, he, he had the dream. He re first resurrected their dream. We've never ever lived in the, in the country that our founders tried to give us because we've never solved this problem. And what Dr. King did was to say, hey, we still can. I have a dream that my four little children will live in a nation where they're judged not by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. His dream was their dream of a colorblind nation. That is 20 or 30 years away if we do the right things now. That's all it's going to take. He said we were going to get there. The night before he was assassinated, he said, I've been to the mountaintop and I've looked over and I've seen the promised land. Now, that wasn't a black promised land. That was the American promised land. He said, I may not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight that we as a people, the American people, will get to that promised land. Our job, all of us, every one of us, is to make his dream come true because that's our dream. That's the American dream. And we've never lived in it. Let's okay. give it a shot. Well, let me talk about a couple more issues. Another point you discuss are the ways in this country, and this is kind of what we're discussing now, but that we use tribalism to divide us, okay? For example, the Black Panthers or the Black Lives Matter uh, makes black people feel better about themselves. It really does. They want to be part of a group that they can feel empowered, and that's understandable, but ultimately it serves as a force of division. And can you explain that? Because I'm sure we're going to have a lot of black folks listen to this and that'll make them angry hearing this. But why does that serve as a force of division? And why, you know, it gets back to the same part about unity and love. I, what I care about is Dr. King's dream. And that was a dream for the children. The only way that a little dark skinned child, any little dark skinned child in this country can ever live a fully American life is in a colorblind society, that there's no other way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we've got to teach everybody that their tribe includes all colors. That's really all we have to do. Everything that we do that divides black from white because they're only 13% of the population is counterproductive. It gets them nothing. You might feel better for a minute, but wouldn't it be better 
to be able to walk down a street and feel you were just fully part of American society. Nobody looked at you. I mean, isn't that better? Well, you know, Black Lives Matter, I've heard a lot of people that didn't like it, right? But at the same standpoint, from my perspective, it never really bothered me because, you know, when I, after learning about the mass incarceration and all the families getting broke up, I can see why they would say, our lives matter. (laughs) Come on, knock this off. But if if, if our life matters too, dear, and they're exactly trying to say that. They get mad at you. And, and, but the pushback was incredible and they need to realize that you gotta look at it from a unity standpoint. Other ways it doesn't work. If you want to help the children, and that's really all I care about right now is helping all the children. If you want to help the children, you cannot do anything that is going to alienate white people because sorry, 87% of the population beats 13%. There's no way for the, for, for a little black child to succeed, really succeed in this country uh, unless we can make the color, country colorblind. That's got to be all our goals. Okay, well, and let's talk about a couple other things that people are going to be questioning. Um, many will not agree with you that the remnants of slavery is our biggest problem, okay? Many will point to globalism, elitism, because, you know, you think about the globalism, the bankers, the economic issues that we have. There are more and more white people that are joining the ranks of the traditional black folks and the Hispanic communities as far as families being broken up, a lot of poor white women don't have dads, mass incarceration, lost jobs, poverty. I mean, a lot of the people being incarcerated are poor people. It's starting to be um, more white poor people as well. There's a lack of opportunity in general. What would you say to this counter argument? I think it all goes back to the problem of, uh, of division in this country between races. That's the, that's the source problem. As someone who still has doo-wop music on my iPad, um, and listens to it all the time. I've got to say, trends start, seem to start in the black community, and then they take over this country. And once they start to take over this country, they take over the world. So if we want to stop all these bad things, I don't care what you, what, where it is or what it is, we've got to create a strong, healthy, united America, first of all. And that's what this is about. Then we can solve all the other problems, too. But, but yes, there is um, the, the breakup of the white family followed by a couple of decades, the breakup of the back black family. We have those problems now, too. So we're just throwing we have, those people in with them. We, we, we would not have any of these problems without the war on poverty. If we had allowed the civil rights movement to, to take its course and brought white and black together as two healthy societies, much healthier back then, we would, we would be a much stronger nation now, and we would be colorblind. Well, you discussed Thomas Jefferson's solution which you did earlier. Can you talk about that a little bit more? What, what did he, he do? He, 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 wrote, he wrote a lot of stuff down, right? So it's, it's documented yeah, well, pretty well. It, it's, his writing, his early writing suggests what he wanted to do. He inherited almost 300 people and he, he hated slavery and he, didn't, he couldn't free them legally in Virginia, but he was going to make it so he could free his slaves and then he was going to hire them back and everybody would be happy. Then he went to Philadelphia in 1775 to the Congress of the Colonies. And as soon as he got there, he saw it wasn't going to be that easy because there was a desperate black underclass growing in the northern cities that was never going to be able to integrate with white Americans. And uh, it, so it was. he thought it was going to destroy whatever they were going to build right at the founding. He was very upset about it. But he was also someone who was kind of hopeful by nature. He spent the revolutionary period working out how you would free slaves when they look different, which was, as I say, it was an aberration in the world. It's really almost never happened before. And he was going to begin by educating the children, empower them, you know, get them, get them uh, trades, teach them to interact comfortably with white people and white people to interact, interact with them. It was going to be a process, maybe over decades. And in the end, he was going to end up with people who were living as reasonably independent adult Americans. He never got that, got to the end of it, but he did get to do the beginning of it. In 1778, thanks to Thomas Jefferson, Virginia of all places became the first state on the face of the earth to ban the importation of people as chattel slaves. That's how he started it. And he, he was in the process of working it out how he would settle the families in, that he owned and do a checkerboard with with white families he thought of importing from Germany because he thought they would get along well. And he would demonstrate and prove that they could work, live comfortably together. And then that would be something he would begin to spread. And he never got that far because she died. His wife died. And he dropped everything and went to France to help to negotiate the peace. And he never came back to it. I don't think he could bear to. 
they had really an amazing marriage. It only lasted 10 years, but he, he lived it the rest of his life. Mm. Well, what would you say to Americans who believe that what their ancestor did, ancestors did 150 years ago or more was not their fault? Cause I mean, I didn't do it. It wasn't and, your fault. Yeah. And that they are struggling to now to make it. So I didn't do it and I'm really struggling too. Um, there's a lot of drugs, messed up child welfare system, bad public schools, shrinking of the middle class. So what do you say to all those white folks out there that says, Hey, I didn't cause slavery. That was somebody who I, you know, I didn't do it. And my life is pretty screwed up too. Your life is screwed up in large part because we've never solved this problem. When we, when this problem is solved, your life will be better. For one example, because of the way we have botched this continuously for the past hundred to almost 200 years, um, there is a roughly 10% of our population that is takers. Now we're dragging them along, holding on to one leg. Mm -hmm. They, they, Bear, if they make a living at all, they, they're getting earned income tax credits. They're on welfare. They're in prison. That's very expensive to keep, uh, you know, 40% of the prison population at any one time is African-American. They've been very costly, and they're really not contributing much of anything to, the, to our society. 10%. When we do this right, we are going to see them not only stop taking, but start producing. So if we have basically the same country, and suddenly we up production by 10%. Won't that help your life too? It'll help everyone's life, but we got to stop the, you got to stop the whole welfare system of every, the people, there are people that really do need help and it can help certain people. But, but if, as, fewer, if fewer people need it, then we won't have to put out as much. We have been stupidly working and living with one hand tied behind our backs all this time by not addressing the fact that we have never finished emancipation. We Once have, we finish that, we'll, we'll have a lot more people pulling the wagon. And wouldn't and you say, wouldn't you say everybody has to learn to pull the wagon? And if they break a leg or something, we help them to. for a short period of time until oh, they can pull the wagon I again. Say they want to pull the wagon. People don't want to live a life yes. dragging along at the bottom of a society. They want to be successful. It's called animal spirits. I'm a business attorney. This, this sense that you, you want to succeed because you know you can succeed and you can hardly wait and you want to be a billionaire, that animal, animal spirits in young people is the reason we have a successful country today. They, that's what drives the economy. And 10% of the people who could have animal spirits are just living as if they're failures because we've made them failures. They're going to all want to be successes. Think of all the activity, all the new businesses started, all the people who are, are, are developing new careers, new inventions, new everything when we unleash the animal spirits in 10% of the population. Okay. It's going to be great. So we all know that there's a, regardless of where you sit on this, this situation, we know that there's a major racial divide. It's pretty obvious. I mean, you have to have your head in the sand to not see that there's a, a major, you know, racial divide in this country. Mm -hmm. What do you ultimately suggest that we do now to end this division of race that we have in this country? We have to, um, I, I'm not, because it's a, that's a, we have only a few minutes, right? That, that's a, that's a more complicated answer and I don't want to make it glib. But the only thing, the, the, the reason why we have to do something extreme is that one of the things that the war on poverty did was to fashion a label for black people that did not exist. People don't understand that this label did not exist before 1965. Um, Dick Gregory called it, calls it the Brand X label. Every black person who's not famous wears that label. And it says less. It says less well-educated, you know, probably didn't have a dad grew up poor, less in the way of prospects, may well have, a, if you're male, a prison record. It's a reasonable label. If you see it, that's not racist because you, you're a person living in the world and you have experience. That label didn't exist before 1965, and we made it. And there is a saying in pottery stores, if you break it, you own it. The, Amer the federal government owns what it did with the war on poverty and continues to do. And so therefore something dramatic needs to be done. And what we are proposing is that every child in the United States who's descended from slavery should have a pre free private elite education, preschool, age of three, very important, right through graduate school. If we do that for one generation, we will never need to do anything like that again. And we will virtually eliminate every, all of the problems of this country in one generation, including making us colorblind. So for every child that was a descendant of slave, slaves, everyone. 
Very interesting. That will be a, what are you getting as uh, feedback to that? I'm not ready to say, <laughs> but I have a feeling it will make news. I think it's going to make news. I, I don't, I, I don't want to laugh because I could just imagine the feedback on that. I, I can I can see if we can just get people to be empowered and get out of that problem. But the feedback, will, you'll get extreme feedback on all sides, and it'll be interesting right, to hear. Do you mind if I disagree with you? Okay, go ahead. 100% of the feedback we've gotten so far at very high levels has been overwhelmingly positive. That's good. More That's than great. I can, I cannot tell you more than that. Okay. I, 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 nobody has said anything negative, and I'm talking a lot of extremely wealthy people. Well, I think the negative will come once it hits the media. Do you know what I mean? And then you'll get everybody coming out of the woodwork making comments. And I, I, I maybe I'm a pessimist. I just can, I can see the, the pushback, but that's part of our unity and making and people loving and understanding how we can nurture and fix other people. And it comes back to the fact that people who feel like they're disenfranchised to how I can see them pushing back and saying, well, how can they get something when I don't, I, I can, I can just see that. So what would you say to that? We all win if we do this. I mean, everybody, everybody listening and watching will have a better life from our doing this. No exceptions. And the, what, what we are in the process of designing will be a way that will help. Well, something will be something that can directly help everyone, not just African-Americans. I mean, they're my particular target. But what we're trying to set up is a way for everybody in this country to be helped as part of the, his or her own unique group in the ways that that need to be need to be helped as opposed to, I mean, one size fits all has never fit all. Basically it fits no one. So we're targeting one problem. And I think based on early feedback, there are other specific problems people are going to be eager to target. Yeah. That, now, think, that's a good answer because I we can't tell you more, but it's going to be exciting. Well, we have a, um, we have a major breakdown of society. I've covered a lot of the issues and um, our child welfare system is another one that really needs to be focused on and it's it's affecting african americans it's affecting whites it's affecting hispanics it's affecting everyone and these poor little ki people who they didn't cause anything are sucked into this terrible system now i love the answer of we will look at each individual i mean we have problems all over and we need to get to each pocket so that we can heal as a country because unless you're, you've covered, I, if someone's going to push back for me until they've walked in my shoes and covered these stories that I've been covering and, and really digging and researching, it's appalling. We need to heal. We have so many broken people out there and that's a shame. We have too many resources. We're always going to, you know, Jesus said, you always have people that need help and there are always going to be some broken people, but we have broken families and broken people in mass. And that is a shame. You know, they, they, the old salesman's adage, if you always do what you always did, you're always going to get what you always got. And we, we have learned that the big old style programs do not work. And in fact, we have learned that white people and rich people and the government don't know best. In fact, they know worst. Um, the federal government is going to be sitting with its face toward the corner with a dunce hat on its head for quite a long while as more people come to understand just how bad the war on poverty has been. But it's not the only stupid thing they've done. The, oh. the, the, the day of the mass solution is gone. We live in the Internet age. The targeted solution where we where in the, in the case of, of the African-American families, we're going to empower the parents. They know what their kids want and need. So let's give them the power to decide for their children. We can do that. We, I mean, I used to, when, when my kids were tiny, we, we got them those little dolls that were customized to look like the child. We can customize for every child in this country the ideal upbringing based on what the parents want. And if we do that, we're going to have a whole bunch of happy and empowered young adults. What will that do? Every one of whom will have been to a preschool where they got to play with children of all races. What will that do? Let's design the, the, the country we can have now that we are able to do in, in minute detail what each person needs. Where can people learn more about you and your books? RobertaGrimes.com is my website. And as I say, a lot is happening for this book. Just stay tuned. Check with my website every so often and I'll keep you posted. But um, there is nothing so powerful as an idea whose time has come. And apparently that's been the case for this, this idea. Excellent. Good job. And thank you very much for joining us today.
Thank you. I sh- may I just say one more thing? Yes. I do a radio program and, and um, a podcast. It's called Seek Reality with Roberta Grimes. So my primary area is death and the afterlife, but I talk about this there too. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me here. And that's all I have for today, folks. I want to just remind you to have an amazing day.